This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Gehring. Jobs blow out. The unemployment rate drops as almost 300,000 new jobs were created in June. Is this a turning point for Main Street? Cracking 17,000, the Dow powered higher through that psychologically important number. But what should you do with your money now if you're 20, 30, 40, or 50? And bright idea, imagine not having to wait to see a doctor. A startup is making that possible and trying to shake up the healthcare industry in the process. We have all that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for this Thursday, July 3rd. Good evening, everyone. I'm Susie Garrow. And I'm Bill Griffith. In tonight for Tyler Matheson, we have two big stories leading the news tonight and both indicative of a strengthening U.S. economy. For the first time ever, the Dow Industrial Average broke through the 17,000 milestone after news that the economy added far more new workers than forecast in June, pushing the nation's jobless rate to its lowest level in nearly six years. Employers added a robust 288,000 jobs last month, that's the fifth straight monthly gain of more than 200,000, sending the unemployment rate this time around to just 6.1%. Uh, Average wages also take higher, rising by six cents an hour. Now, even with the markets closing at 1 p.m. Eastern time ahead of the July 4th holiday, investors rallied on the news, making history on Wall Street. The Dow was up 92 points at the close, a new record high of 17,068. The Nasdaq was up 28 points, closing at a 14-year high, and the S&P added 10. That's also a new all-time high for that index. We have two reports tonight now. Bob Pisani tells us about the Dow reaching the 17,000 mark and what it means for investors and the economy. But we begin with Hampton Pearson and a closer look at that June jobs report. June's robust employment gains are the latest evidence of the job market gaining momentum. The economy has averaged 272,000 jobs per month for each of the last three months and gained 2.5 million new workers over the last year. Job growth in June was widespread with professional and business services, retail trade, bars and restaurants, and health care along with manufacturing all contributing. On the eve of Independence Day, President Obama paid a visit to 1776, a job incubator firm, to celebrate what the administration hopes is a turning point for the job market. We just got a jobs report today showing that we've now seen the fastest job growth in the United States in the first half of the year since 1999. Uh, so, so that's... This is also uh, the first time we've seen five consecutive months of job growth over 200,000 since 1999. And, and we've seen the quickest drop in unemployment in 30 years. The unemployment rate, now at 6.1 percent, is the lowest since the 2008 financial crisis, with a dramatic decline in long-term unemployment. The number of Americans out of work for six months or longer has dropped by 1.2 million over the last year to just under 3.1 million, half of what it was three years ago. But wages have barely moved, up just 2 percent in the last 12 months. Leading economists say a change is coming. I do think we'll see wage growth pick up over the next uh, 12 months quite rapidly. I think the real issue here is people don't realize that the labor market's improved. Millions of Americans, however, are still sitting on the employment sidelines. Just under 63 percent of adult Americans are working or looking for a job. That's the lowest labor force participation rate since the late 70s. Some leading economists say that's enough of a speed bump to keep Fed Chair Janet Yellen and her fellow monetary policymakers reluctant to move up their timetable for raising key short-term interest rates. We're not seeing that participation rate come up, which is really what you need to see on sort of Janet Yellen's dashboard of things of a healthier labor market. That means they're going to be slow in raising rates and then keep them lower longer than they would have in the past. On the eve of Independence Day, Dow 17,000 and a blockbuster jobs report gave both Wall Street and Main Street reasons to celebrate. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Hampton Pearson in Washington. The jobs report proved to be the catalyst to finally get the Dow over 17,000. Now, how important is Dow 17,000? Big round numbers are psychologically important because they focus attention on the market's strength. 
It's another historic high for that index. And more importantly, it happened on a day when the jobs report clearly indicates the economy is improving. Now people will see the news headline tomorrow, strong jobs report for June, which also mentions the fact that the stock market has hit another new high. That's sure to spark discussion about whether it's time to put more money back into the market or even get back in. But a survey we did in the New York area indicated many are still very skeptical. It's not going to change what I do investment wise. Uh, certainly there's still a lot of uncertainty in the world. This is the latest in a string of strong economic reports. This morning a survey of businesses in the services sector also showed improving demand for employment, which also supports a rebound in growth in the second half of the year. OK, so what's the risk for stocks right now? Traders have one big concern a rapid spike in interest rates that could come if everyone is convinced that rapid economic growth will lead to much stronger inflation than expected. But the key word is rapid rise in rates. For example, if the 10-year Treasury yield went from 2.6% to 3.6% in a few days. But many believe that the stock market could stand a slow rise in rates as long as there's clear evidence the economy continues to improve. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. John Manley joins us now. He's chief equity strategist at Wells Fargo Funds. John, great to have you with us uh, today. You know, it is exciting to have these historic highs and these milestones, but how should Americans feel about all of this? You know, Dow 17,000, strong jobs number, but the economic number, the economic growth, GDP, on the downside. So, you know, connect the dots for us. How healthy is the economy and the stock market? Well, every now and then you have to ignore a few dots that I think are so, sort of out of place. I think things are going from OK to good, uh, and I think that's good for the stock market. Uh, I think that the Fed is going to be slow to raise rates because they want to make sure, very sure, it's OK before they do. And meanwhile, earnings are accelerating. So I think earnings go up before interest rates, and that's good for stocks. Stocks, though, John, are supposed to zig and zag. They go up and they go down. They've been going up for two and a half years. We haven't had an appreciable uh, decline of 10 percent. The proverbial correction in this market for a while. Are we setting ourselves up as we go higher for even more pain when the correction finally does come, do you think? You know, someday it's going to come. Uh, I, I guarantee you I will not sell at the top, but I think I'll sell within 5 or 6 percent of the top. We've had a pretty good number of 5 to 10 percent corrections, let's say 5 to 7 percent corrections. That took the steam off. And as your report said earlier, people are still skeptical. It's that skepticism that has to be maintained rather than a round number like a 10 percenter. You know, starting next week, you mentioned earnings a moment ago. Starting next week, we're going to start hearing uh, from companies with their corporate uh, reports for the second quarter. Do you think that what we hear from CEOs and we look at the numbers and the guidance looking forward are going to take stocks higher or lower? Higher. If I had to pick one, it'd be higher. I think the numbers going to be pretty good. Uh, you never know exactly what's going to come until it comes. But the last week of, of the quarter is usually the, the confessional period when you get the bad numbers, if they're going to be there. We didn't see that many. And I get the sense that earnings are beginning to lift off rather than settle back. J.P. Morgan today, with that strong jobs report, moved up the timetable when it thinks the Fed will begin to actually raise interest rates. It now thinks it could happen this time next year if, in fact, the economy is starting to pick up pace and the Fed is likely to raise rates sooner than expected. Is that good or bad for stocks? You know, I think it's good if they're doing the right thing. You know, I think the Fed, I don't think the Fed will raise interest rates unless they feel that raising interest rates will not have an impact on the economy. You have to listen to what Chair Yellen says. She wants to encourage the economy. She's going to want to encourage it for some time. Even the first few rate hikes are just a realization that the economy can deal with higher interest rates. It's not a reduction in the stimulus, really. So, John, are you doing anything differently with your investment strategy, given today's news and just the momentum that we've been seeing over the last couple of weeks? You know, we, we focused on, uh, on, on cyclical stocks for a while, not deep cyclicals. We focused on, on things like, like energy and technology, where earnings beginning to lift off uh, industrials. I think that's still a good play. And don't forget to look offshore. I mean, I still think that Europe may do better. And emerging markets are in such distress, I would say, that there's got to be a longer-term play there as well. All right. Thank you so much, John. Have a nice holiday weekend. Thank you. John Manley of Wells Fargo Funds. Still ahead, one size does not fit all when it comes to investment advice. So with the Dow here at 17,000, two financial advisors join us to offer tips if you're 20, 30, 40, or 50, or beyond.
More now on jobs and the positions that are in demand in the new economy, including ones in a high-tech industry that are getting a big boost from a small college in Massachusetts. Mary Thompson has more on where the jobs are. In biotech manufacturing, a technician's job is to grow healthy cells in a clean, strictly regulated environment, a job Shire Pharmaceuticals' Bill Shambrone says can be the hardest for the company to fill. So the ideal candidate for us is someone who has been exposed to some of the hands-on laboratory work, of the manipulation of the equipment, uh, the use of diagnostic um, tools. Those are the type of people that are most in demand. That demand, the reason Quincy College launched a two-year program to train biomanufacturing technicians three years ago. They decided that for the students and the opportunity for students to get jobs, to teach biomanufacturing bio and compliance would be the best fit for the students. The Quincy program is unique because of the hands-on experience students receive working on state-of-the-art equipment like this wave rocker. The wave rocker used by companies like Shire to grow cells that produce enzymes needed for the drugs it makes at its rare disease hub in Lexington, Massachusetts. Students learn to shepherd these cells as they multiply, then extract the needed proteins just as they would in the working world. So what's the employment outlook? The Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates that the outlook for job growth for biomanufacturing technicians is 10% from 2012 to 2022. That's 8,000 new jobs. 393 of those jobs are expected to be in the Bay State by 2016. So Quincy College's Bruce Van Dyke worked closely with local firms to design the school's program. If you're not doing what they need you to do, then you're wasting your time. 25-year-old Alex Wilson isn't wasting time. A Quincy graduate hired by Shire last year as a technician, he works four 10-hour shifts a week and overtime when he can get it. My five-year plan would be to be a lead in my department. My 10-year plan would to be switch departments and go into R&D research and development. The Bureau of Labor Statistics says entry-level technicians like Wilson earn about $40,000 a year. Shire declined to say what it pays, only that its pay is competitive and employees receive full benefits, including tuition reimbursement. They're well compensated, especially relative to, say, other recent college graduates or in many cases high school or junior college graduates. These are really good jobs for people starting out in the workforce. 27-year-old Daria Kotoski isn't starting out She's kickstarting her career in biotech. It's ever changing. It's huge right now. It's not going away. And neither is she. A top student at Quincy, she's interning now and is setting her sights on a future in neurological research, cultivating an ambition that's been grown in a lab. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Mary Thompson in Quincy, Massachusetts. And to read more about this biotech training program, you can log on to our website at nbr.com. Elsewhere, Boeing ramped up deliveries in June, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The plane maker nearly doubled its deliveries of its 787 Dreamliner, helping it increase deliveries by 7% from a year earlier. The Dow component says that its defense, space, and security unit also saw delivery gains. So shares rose a fraction to $128.51. And shares of Walgreen and Rite Aid were higher on new sales that were up in June. The uh, pharmacy operators reported increased same-store sales driven by higher pharmacy sales themselves. Investors cheered the news since drugstore retailers' sales and margins have been pressured lately by a wave of generic drugs introduced. Shares of Walgreen morose more than 1% to the $73 and change. Rite Aid popped by 5.5%, closed at $7.5. And shares of PetSmart soared on news of activist interest in the pet food retailer. In this case, it's hedge fund Jana Partners that has now taken a 9.9% stake in the company. And we'll talk to management and shareholders about a possible sale to improve its performance. That stock was up 12.5% on that news, higher to $67.28. Advisors to Lululemon's founder Chip Wilson have been discussing with private equity firms the possibility of taking the retailer private. According to reports, one of the firms that's in talks with the yoga apparel maker is Leonard Green & Partners. That sent shares up nearly 3 percent to $42.60.
Google's removal of some search results in Europe is being criticized as press censorship. The most recent article set to be removed and getting the most attention, a seven-year-old blog post uh, criticizing former Merrill Lynch CEO Stan O'Neill. Google says individuals have the right to request the removal of certain links. But despite all of that, Google Class A shares still rose a fraction to $593 and change. Big tobacco companies Lorillard and Reynolds American may be merging by the end of the month. According to reports, the companies have not fully negotiated terms, but they're said to be just a few weeks away from announcing a deal. Shares of Lorillard jumped on the news up 5 percent to $64.41. Reynolds American rose more than 2 percent to $61.56. And that good jobs report that we told you about also helped cer uh, send certain stocks higher. Shares of staffing companies, Manpower Group and Robert Half International, both rose on the upbeat employment picture. Manpower rose more than 1 percent to 86.15. Robert Half also 1 percent higher to 49 and a penny. OK, so now that the Dow has reached another historic milestone, you're probably wondering what to do with your money whether you're in your 20s or your 50s or even beyond. So let's get some answers tonight. We have Paul Oslander. He's Director of Financial Planning at Provice Management, and Avni Ramnani, who's Director of Financial Planning and Investment Management at Francis Financial. Good to see you both. Thank you for joining us tonight. Paul, Thank you. it depends uh, on where you are in your life cycle. We don't have time to go through every decade of your life, but generally speaking, 20s, 30s, 40s, what are you going to do with your money right now, do you think? The 20-year-old is going to keep more in equities, and the 50-year-old is going to keep less in equities. I mean, that's the general rule of thumb. It doesn't matter what level the market's at. I don't We're think so. We're lofty levels right now. I don't think so. I tell the clients the same thing, whether the Dow is at 13,000, 16,000, or 17,000. It's all about asset allocation. Look at the amount of risk that you're willing to accept. Test that every quarter now, as opposed to every year. Make sure that you're comfortable with some amount that you might lose, and then adjust Adjust your allocation accordingly. Let's check in with Avni. Do you agree with that? And if you do, how aggressive should that 20 or 30 something be with their stock investments? You know, a 20 year old can be a lot more aggressive. I would go up to 70 percent uh, to 75 percent in an equity uh, allocation. And then definitely bonds have to play a role too. So keep the rest of the portfolio in bonds. And uh, as far as what the market's doing right now, really, you have to focus on the long term, especially for a 20-year-old. You're not going to use this money, hopefully, um, and for the next 35 to 40 years. And for that time frame, you have a lot of ups and downs coming your way. So you have to take your emotions out of the investment process and keep with their asset allocation. Avni, uh, lately, because of the historically low yields that people are getting from their investments, specifically in bonds, they've forego bonds and go with dividend-paying stocks instead. A wise move, riskier, what do you think? I think bonds still need to be in the portfolio. Like I said, if you're not going to use this for the next 40 years, uh, there's going to be ups and downs in the market. Sometimes equities are going to be up. Sometimes bonds are going to be up. So each segment has its own role to play. And I would uh, shy away from um, getting rid of bonds completely and having stocks all in the portfolio. So let's turn, Paul, to somebody who's in their 50s or maybe somebody who's in retirement or close to retirement. Mm -hmm. You say that you meet with this group on a regular basis because yeah. it's not like being 20-something. What's your advice? Well, to Bill's point, I think as you get a little bit older, you have to be <clears throat> excuse me, careful with, with how much you have in equities. But more importantly, and I live in Florida, we see a lot of this. Retired investors haven't been able to get yields from bonds or from CDs, so they've naturally gone more into equities, more into dividend paying stocks. That's the group of investor I'm most worried about. I think they've taken more risks than they're really ready to assume. And those are the people that I'm talking to. And to Avni's point, I agree that there should be some money in bonds, but I worry that when interest rates rise, bonds will come down in value. So short term bonds only, in my view, when you have that. But are you allocation. telling this age group that maybe they should take some profits given the unbelievable run that we've seen in the market? I think it's a combination of taking profits, but more importantly, adjusting that asset allocation strategy so that there will be more in bonds than in equities. And in those bonds, though, I think it's critical that they be very short term to anticipate that whenever it happens, that rise in interest rates. Not to put too fine a point on things because of the time we have uh, allotted to us, but stocks are not all equal. You've got riskier growth stocks. You've got the safer, so, so to speak, defensive plays. Yeah. Yeah. 
What, what about a mixture? Well, there? and again, we discuss dividend paying stocks, largely large cap stocks most of the time. We like a small cap value tilt. I think that's the growth strategy that's worked best for many years. But having said that, there's safety in the large cap mm -hmm. companies. Some final thoughts from uh, both of you. Avni, let me uh, start with you. We've been talking about the things you should do. What uh, is the key thing that you would advise someone in their 20s, 30s, and 40s not to do? And uh, then we're going to turn to Paul and see what he says. I think what you not, shouldn't do is uh, not get carried away by the ups and downs of the market. Uh, the emotions play a big part and mm -hmm. you need to really learn how to take those away. I would like to add that emerging markets, and you mentioned before, emerging markets is a segment that especially uh, is very important for 20, 30 year olds uh, because that's where we are seeing uh, a growth capacity a potential in the next 10, 15 okay. to 20 years. Real quickly, the best tip about what not to do, no mistakes need, to avoid. No knee-jerk reactions. Stick to your plan, mm -hmm. adjust where you need to and fine-tune, but don't do anything dramatic and don't For any panic. age group, really. I, absolutely. Take the emotion out. Easier said than done, but very good advice. Thank you both, and have a good holiday weekend. Thank Paul you. Paul of Pro Vice Management, Avni Romnani from Finan Francis Financial as well. Thank you. Thank you. And coming up on the program, how one startup is rethinking the way healthcare is delivered, cutting costs, and maybe even saving you a trip to the emergency room. A real setback in Illinois' efforts to increase what state retirees pay for their health benefits. The Illinois Supreme Court ruled today that the state's constitution's pen pension protection clause prevents any reduction of health care benefits for retired state workers, even though the state's pension coffers are severely underfunded. Bill? Meanwhile, mortgage rates are edging lower still. Freddie Mac reports that average mortgage rates on a 30-year fixed-rate loan dipped a little bit this week. They're down to 4.12 percent, down from 4.14 percent just a week ago. And finally tonight, we all know the hassles of seeing a doctor or waiting for hours in the emergency room. What if you could bypass all that? Well, one young physician had a bright idea that's making that possible. And in the process, he's helping patients and doctors too. You write in and you just say, hey, uh, I have a sore throat. Jay Parkinson is a doctor. His patient, our healthcare system. Everybody knows healthcare is broken and inefficient. That's why he started Sherpa. The two year old service provides access to doctors 24 7, online and on the phone. They can answer questions, give advice, diagnose problems, prescribe medications, and speed the referral process. And it's paid for by employers. More than 100 companies are paying about $30 a month per employee to offer Sherpa as a benefit. Nobody's ever said this is a bad idea, ever. Certainly not Martin Refsal. I woke up one morning and I just felt deathly ill. Refsal works at Canary, a New York tech startup. He has a primary care physician, but calls Sherpa instead. In less than an hour, I had a prescription called in to the pharmacy just on the block, and I had a referral to a specialist who I went and saw later that afternoon. Better yet, communications with Sherpa don't generate any insurance claims. Parkinson says the service is reducing claims by about 70 percent. So the company all of a sudden looks really healthy, so their premiums uh, increase uh, much less. It's not the first time Parkinson has mixed medicine with modern technology. In 2007, his first practice literally took to the streets in Brooklyn. He was carrying about $280,000 in student debt and couldn't afford to rent office space. So he began texting and emailing with patients. His story attracted national media. Half my day was spent answering reporters' questions, uh, you know, book offers, movie offers. It, it was insane. Instead of trying to become a star, he dedicated himself to improving the healthcare experience for patients and for doctors. The doctor has this hierarchical position, and what this does is put the patient in charge in a big way. 
Ida Santana is a staff doctor at Sherpa and earns more than she might as an average primary care physician. It's really kind of moving medicine into an electronic age where um, most doctors don't email with their patients and that's like who doesn't email. So far, companies are using Sherpa in New York, New Jersey and California, with Illinois coming on board soon. White Ops is a New York cybersecurity firm. Its COO, Ash Kalb, stumbled across Sherpa and is now a big believer. And we started talking about what the ideal healthcare program would look like. And uh, we didn't think it existed, but I started Googling around and I came across Sherpa and it was basically exactly what we had described to each other as what we like. Kalb thinks having a doctor on call is making his company more efficient. His employees don't need to see a doctor in order to communicate with one. And that's what Jay Parkinson calls progress. To me, the future of primary care looks a lot like what we're doing here. <laughs> Dr. Parkinson and his team have really tried to create a win-win for employers and employees. And he says even the specialists that Sherpa contacts are incentivized to cut wait times because they're depending on Sherpa for more referrals. I hope we see more stuff like this. That's it. We all know the, our medical industry needs to be overhauled in terms of the service out there, and it's happening slowly, bit by bit, through the doctors. Yeah, I think by everybody. the way, I've enjoyed the past couple of weeks here. In case you're wondering, Tyler has just been on vacation for two weeks. He'll be back. I know we'll be here it, tomorrow it for fun. July 4th, yeah. but he'll be back on Monday, and I look forward it's to it. Great having you, back. always. Yeah. Always good. And that's Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Susie Garib. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a wonderful holiday weekend. We will see you tomorrow, though, for a special July 4th edition of Nightly Business Report. See you then. I'm Susie Garrett with a nightly business report news brief. Fireworks on Wall Street today. The Dow broke through 17,000 milestone for the first time ever on news that American businesses hired far more new workers than forecast. Employers added 288,000 jobs in June, pushing the unemployment rate down to just 6.1%. Investors bought up stocks even with the markets closing early for the 4th of July holiday. The Dow shot up 92 points to a new record at 17,068. The Nasdaq was up 28, closing at a 14-year high. And the S&P added 10 points, also a new all-time high. And you'll pay more at the pump this holiday weekend. The average price of a gallon of gas is now $3.67, 20 cents more than a year ago, and the most paid on July 4th in six years. Be sure to tune in to Nightly Business Report right here on your public television station.